There's a question I used to get asked all the time. Where did I get the money for all that travel? Did my company IPO? No. Am I a trust fund baby? No. International jewel thief? The truth is, when my very first dancing video took off back in 2005, I'd already spent all the money I saved on travel. Someone had uploaded my video onto this new website called YouTube, and a chewing gum brand named Stride contacted me and asked if I'd make another video for them. This was in the very early days, before YouTube had ads, when companies were first trying to get a handle on this viral marketing thing. So Stride sponsored me to take a big trip, and that was that. The dancing video I made for them in 2006 turned out well enough that when I told them they needed to send me around the world again so I could get big groups of people to dance with me, they were willing to foot the bill once more and this time give me a whole year. I finished the video just under the wire as YouTube was first launching their partner program and testing out pre-roll ads. So the economics of creators working with brands still hadn't quite been established. Stride sponsored me one last time and YouTube was nice enough to look the other way. Their logo appears at the very end of the video. I mean the very, very end. No one watches that far and a lot of people never even notice it which leaves it as kind of a mystery who paid for all that travel. And it was a lot of travel. I took over 120 flights to make that video, enough to fly around the world eight times, not to mention trains, cars, boats, and camels. And no, I didn't have my act together with frequent flyer programs. I was flying weird routes on all sorts of different airlines, so all those miles were lost, like tears. Stride Gum's parent company was later sold, and to the best of my knowledge, the gums stopped showing up in stores at some point in the 2010s. I no longer have any affiliation with the brand, so I can finally speak freely about the ridiculously long-lasting flavor of Stride Sugar-Free Gum. I'm not going to test how long-lasting it is. I got this box off eBay, and it's probably really old. No. I'm Matt Harding, and this is part two of how I made the 2008 Where the Hell is Matt video. The Zero Gravity Shot. Am I in outer space? No, I am on the Vomit Comet. There's a company called Zero G that flies a hollowed out Boeing 727 in what's called parabolic flight. The way it works is the plane climbs really fast and for 30 seconds, the force of gravity is effectively doubled. You're pinned to the floor. Then the plane flies down really fast, and for 30 seconds, you're free falling inside the plane at the same speed it's dropping, which creates the illusion of weightlessness. <laughs> Tickets on the Vomit Comet are not cheap. The company was nice enough to assign a crew member to record me dancing, so I only needed to buy one. I showed him how to use the camera. He started recording. The plane dropped. And the camera shut down. Small technical error, no big deal. The flight gave us 15 parabolas, so we had plenty of chances. I went over the buttons with him again, and we gave it another try. The plane dropped. The camera shut down again. And again. And again. 15 times I tried dancing in a weightless environment, and I didn't get one usable clip. Here's what was going on. This was back in 2007, and I was using one of the first camcorders on the market that shot in HD. It recorded onto a hard disk drive inside the camera. A hard disk drive has actual spinning plates that get written on almost like a vinyl record player. Now, a conventional spinning hard drive has a built-in drop-detecting fail-safe mechanism. So if it thinks it's falling to the ground, it will automatically stop writing onto the plates to protect the data from damage when it lands. My camera was designed to shut down instantly if it was falling, and there was nothing I could do about it. So what did I do? I went home and bought a different camera. Sony put a new one on the market a few months later that recorded onto solid state memory, which has no moving parts and is what all our smartphones record onto today. I had the misfortune of buying a video camera during the brief moment when they thought it was a good idea to record onto hard disks, and then doing the one thing you absolutely cannot do with them, which is record while free falling through the air. Zero G was nice enough to sell me a redo ticket at cost. I went up again and got the shot that's in the video.
Was it fun being weightless? Yeah, kinda. I imagined it'd be like going into space, and I'd have a profound moment of life-altering perspective about the pale blue dot we called eh. No. Everybody screams, and then there's a lot of flailing and kicking, and then gravity returns and you collapse in a heap. It was more like a very expensive amusement park ride. I'm thrilled to say I didn't vomit, and neither did anyone else. Because of course, when one person goes, everyone goes, and then we're all floating through one another's space barf. There's a silver lining to the whole HD thing. When I put the video out, HD content was almost non-existent online. YouTube didn't even display above standard resolution yet, but you could upload footage in HD and they stored that file on their servers. So a few months later when they did debut HD content, my video was one of the very few they had available. YouTube actually used it to promote their new feature, which got the video a ton of additional views. It's a case where investing early in an unproven technology mixed with some dumb luck and eventually paid off nicely. That's a little YouTube history lesson for you. I wanted to include North Korea in the video, but I couldn't because my sponsor actually wrote into the contract that it was forbidden. I couldn't enter North Korea or any of about a dozen other global conflict areas like Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and Syria. They had a corporate policy about not doing business in those countries. I could argue all day that I wasn't doing business there, but it became clear they weren't gonna budge. Which drove me crazy because, of course, those were the places I most wanted to include. There's a lesson I keep learning over and over again from travel. When you're face to face, people everywhere are a whole lot friendlier and more welcoming than we're led to believe. The differences become smaller when you go out there and engage. Am I claiming that travel makes people more open-minded, less racist? Yes. If you do it right, that is what I'm saying. And back then, I thought the internet was going to magnify that effect. A lot of people did. It was this brand new thing that was going to make us better, make us freer and happier. It was going to disrupt the entrenched power structures, remove the gatekeepers, and give us the power to share and connect as individuals without the filters of mainstream media. Anywho, for this project, the closest I could get to North Korea was to visit the Demilitarized Zone, which is a narrow strip of borderland between North and South Korea. You can take a tour of the DMZ that leaves every day out of Seoul. The tour is run by the USO, so it was all in English with an American guide. This clip seems like it was hard to get, but it was actually shockingly easy. I was able to shoot it in the room right on the line where the countries used to meet when they needed to talk. The national border is running between that guard's legs. I'm actually past the line here, so you could say I'm in North Korea and in breach of my sponsorship contract. Yes! I win! A lot of people assume that's a North Korean guard standing there. And to tell you the truth, I kind of wanted people to assume that, but he's actually a South Korean guard, and he's blocking the door so I don't run through and try to defect, which is actually a thing that's happened. From our vantage point, we could see across into North Korea, where there was a city and an impossibly tall flagpole. They told us it was completely empty, a fake city known by the South Koreans as Propaganda Village that was built in the 50s in response to a real South Korean city called Daechongdong that the North Koreans could see from their side. In the 80s, the South Korean city put up a tall flagpole with a big South Korean flag on it. So North Korea had to build an even taller flagpole with an even bigger flag on it. At the time I saw it, it had just lost the title of world's tallest flagpole to Azerbaijan and has since been exceeded by even taller flagpoles in Tajikistan and Saudi Arabia. Congratulations all of you on your enormous flagpoles. If you're wondering where the tallest flagpole in the United States is, the answer is Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And if you're wondering if I only mentioned that because I wanted to say Sheboygan, you are correct. Sheboygan! When I landed in Delhi, I'd been traveling almost non-stop for a year, and I was running out of time to finish the video. India has a massive dance tradition, but I didn't have any contacts, hadn't done any preparation, and you can't just rustle up a Bollywood dance troupe out of nowhere. So after running low on time and running out of ideas, I wrote to my partner Melissa back in Seattle. I asked her for help and then fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, she had rustled up a Bollywood dance troupe out of nowhere. She found a choreographer named Rahul. He gathered the dancers and got us a wedding venue in Gurgaon where we could shoot the next day. Seeing them all get into costume and rehearse, it felt a little off to just do the same dance I always do. It seemed like bad manners. I thought I should at least try to learn some of their moves. That may not sound like a big deal, but believe me when I say this, I had never learned a dance step in my life. Never even made an attempt. 
I had one dance I felt safe doing, and it had taken me pretty far. I was scared that if I broke out of that and actually made an effort to do something new, I would embarrass myself. But I decided to just try my best, no half-assing it. Hey, what? Eight, eight, one, two, Rahul taught me the steps. It was the first time I'd ever followed an eight count beat. The colors, the choreography, it was one of those times when everything came together perfectly. You can't even tell it was 110 degrees and I was gradually melting into a puddle. It's my favorite moment in the video. And that's it for this video. Let me know what you want to hear about in the comments. There's more to come. Thanks for watching.